All right, welcome everybody to Limited Level Ups. I'm Alex, and we've got a really special episode today. We are joined by the one and only Reed Duke on the podcast today. Reed, how's it going? It's going great. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, I mean, uh, I, it's a bit of a formality potentially at this point. I'm sure most people watching know who you are, but you know, maybe there's some uh, newer folks to Magic listening. Why don't you just give a quick rundown as, of who you are as a player and maybe a little bit of your background as a person. Maybe you'll even, you know, how you got into Magic. A little, a little bit of a condensed uh, Magic life story here. Sure. Yeah. So I'm a, a lifelong Magic player. Um, so, you know, your, your, your two questions of like, who are you as a Magic player and who are, who are you outside of Magic? Th those are like pretty well entwined. Yeah. I've been <laughs> playing my whole life and uh, I've been on the Magic Pro Tour since 2010. Um, and yeah, for the, the last you know handful of years or, or decade or so, I've, I've made my full-time living uh, from competing and making Magic content and just being you know immersed in the game sort of. Yeah, so I mean, Reed, I really am happy to have you on the show today because I think the way that you just carry yourself, but also the magic content you put out really aligns with what we do on the show here. We're all about, you know, education and magic, really helping people get better. And, you know, I can't think of anybody better I would want on the show to talk about, because not only are you, you know, just a fantastic player, but the way you communicate your ideas, I think is really, really just, uh, you know, outstanding. So really happy to pick your brain a little bit today. What we're going to be doing today, it's going to be kind of a Q&A interview style episode where I'm going to be asking Reed some questions. I've got some questions myself and the community has some questions that they have sent to me that they want me to ask Reed. So we're just going to get, you know, have a good combo going on here. Just uh, maybe do some, you know, small level ups here and there. Get Reed's perspective both on, you know, some uh, some in-game stuff, but also some big picture stuff as well. So really excited to get into that. Of course, before we do, I want to give a quick shout out to the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited level ups. That's the place you can go if you want to support the show. If you like what we're doing here, if you like our content, if you feel like it's gotten you a little bit better at magic in some way, maybe helped you win a few more drafts, check it out over there. There's a bunch of reward tiers that, you know, we want to give back to you over there. Go check it out. I won't go too in depth because I do really, uh, you know, I'm very excited to uh, get into this today, but that's all I got to say. Check it out if you want to support the show and read. Why don't we uh, just jump into this? So the, the thing I always ask my guests when I come on the show or when they come on the show is, uh, you know, this is limited level ups. And I think it's really great to learn from people who have gone through the magic learning process, gone through the grind, as it were, really, you know, train themselves. And I think, you know, very much when I think of uh, Reed Duke, I think of somebody who has really trained themselves to become the magic player you are today. Can you recall any specific moments in your learning of the game or getting better where after you, you know, had that level up, that light bulb moment, you're like, wow, I, I'm seeing the game completely differently here now. You know, it doesn't have to be one moment, maybe a few in there, but uh, anything, maybe maybe we'll start from, you know, when you were first learning or as you were, you know, really start to feel, feel like you were getting better at the game. I think a huge one was when I downloaded Magic Online. Mm, yeah. Um, because, I, you know, I played for a long time before that, and I consider myself to be a good player, at least, you know, at the, the local game store level. Uh, but there's just such a difference between a good player who plays one or two times per week with like sort of the local crowd versus a player who can access, you know, competitive games of magic 24 hours a day, seven days a week against people from all over the world at all, all levels, just like basically the, the, the resources and the new world that magic online opened up for me, um, was, was huge. I think from, yeah, from, from clearing that hurdle, which, by the way, is quite a big hurdle of being like a big fish in a small pond to actually being, you know, exposed to the, the, the very best players in the world. Yeah, totally. I think so. Yeah, you know, in a way, it's just it's just the reps, just like getting, you know, you can have all the theory in the world, but getting in those reps, I think it is really important. And for, you know, it's funny you say that because that was a huge level up for me, too. I've talked in the show about that as well. When, you know, I was like, oh, let's try this magic online thing out. Maybe I'll get in a few more drafts, uh, you know, a, a few drafts a month that I might have not otherwise. And, you know, it was definitely more than a few drafts a month where it's like, yeah. oh, I can just do this every single day. It's awesome. Um, what about, you know, you, you kind of everything, I think everybody who has gotten to the elite, you know, pro or semi-competitive level, um, they kind of have two stages or maybe a few stages in their magic development from, you know, you think back from the, the before times and now you're like, well, I'm playing with these best of the best players in the world. Do you have anything you can recall that once you started playing with that, you know, you were in that big, uh, that big pond, the bigger pond at that point, you're like, wow, now I feel like I've really leveled up. I've learned from these, the, the best of the best players in the world. 
this, the harsh truth is that the the le- your level ups often come with a lot of growing pains. Mm-hmm. And I actually had a very hard time uh, when I when I first got on the pro tour because I had been like a very good PTQ level player for quite a long time. You know, like we're talking 10, 20 like PTQ top eights to the point where I was I was making them pretty consistently, but like not breaking through. Um, and then I made it to the pro tour. So suddenly it was a shift from the mindset of like, how do I have the highest possible win rate against players who are less experienced than me? Yep. Suddenly like now, how do I get wins against players who are better than me? Sometimes much better than me. And so I, I actually, you know, like I had to play basically six pro tours before I ever had a winning record at that level. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's the way you have to do it. And, and you just clear one hurdle at a time. Um, but, but playing with the better players is the fastest way to improve. And um, I guess the next sort of level up that I think of in my career was when I actually got on a big, like professional testing team, uh, what we called the Pantheon. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was, that was pretty awesome because I got to draft with people who, you know, th- these people who had just been elite booster drafters for, for, for 20 years. Um, and that's a big difference, uh, getting to, to hear their ideas and, and see the way they approach things. And, uh, I have one specific tournament that's like sticks re- really firmly in my mind when we played a uh, storm combo in modern it was like yeah. a team deck and that our expert player was John Finkel. Um, <laughs> and he, he would just sort of like pace you know like the stern general like standing behind everyone <laughs> as they played games of paper storm and it, you know you would you would like feel this presence of john standing <laughs> behind you and you'd go to you go tap your island place here because you'd be like nope <laughs> the plan first you know sequencing matters here and so just like you, you know just just the the um i guess the attention to detail the perfectionism and just unlocking like ways of thinking that you didn't even know existed uh sometimes when you get exposed to these these great players yeah and it's well i i you know i'm talking about i've talked a little bit about you know things i think about when i think about you know you as a player and you know i've watched a bunch of your content i think you Luis, were like two of the big people that when i started watching magic content i think of like you know these are the big people that i would you know invest some time into watching because i really uh, enjoyed what you had to say in your, your approach to just the, the style of your approach. And when I think it, it's funny, you, you talk about John in that way. I think of that as, you know, for my generation, that that's you or Louise for me. You're just like that kind of player, just like, you know, really that attention to detail, making sure you're getting that process right. So, you know, whatever, uh, maybe those lessons that John <laughs> or other great players instilled with you, I think they really carried over. Um, let's talk about just quickly, you know, another thing when I think about you as a player is, your focus on self-improvement and, you know, never just stagnating. You're like, really just wanting to get better. You know, I've heard stories, uh, maybe it was from you, maybe it was from other players, of you going back and, you know, watching matches of your top eight matches at Pro Tours and, you know, taking notes or just going back and seeing, what did I make a mistake, you know, how did I make a mistake here? Maybe next time I can do something better. Do you have any words just on your philosophy of self-improvement as a player or maybe some more, you know, practical things uh, for players looking to get better, the, the actual process of that? Yeah, so, you know, by the... By now, uh, just from the things we've already talked about, the, the listeners can probably gather that like I wasn't, you know, born as an elite Magic player. Like I, I had to sort of pay my dues and lose a lot at a lot of different levels before I, I um, you know, made it as far as I did. So I, I believe that if you want to dedicate yourself to Magic, it's less important like how naturally talented you are or how good you are now. And more important, what is your ability and your passion for learning? Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times that that requires like honesty. It requires um, a lot of hard work. Uh, but you know, our our natural tendency is to sort of just jam games of magic and have fun and play a lot. Like maybe you you know find a deck you like, you change some cards, but you can get so much more out of the games that you play if, if you really employ like patience and honesty and, and hard work. Um, and I think it's, it's just about like focusing on the games and learning from the games in a way where you really understand what's going on and what's causing you to win and lose Mm -hmm. and how you can pick up extra percentage points. And uh, you know, the more you do that, the the greater your understanding of magic and the more 
you'll find ways like whether it be in deck building or or drafting or sideboarding or gameplay to you know just pick up extra percentage points and uh, be the best player that you can be. Totally, yeah, yeah. It's you know a very holistic approach, and just you know to get into some specifics potentially. You know, when you're talking about looking back at your games, your drafts, I think a big hurdle that a lot of players I, I find have trouble getting over is the whole, you know, I, I'm not sure, I don't know what I don't know, right? And I'm sure, you know, as, as you're learning and as every player learns, they, they have this uh, this task of actually being able to identify, oh, this, maybe not even this is a mistake, but, oh, this play or this pick could potentially be a mistake. Here's something that um, I should look into. It might be a mistake. It might not be. But here's like a, a certain point I can dial in on. Um, w- and this is, you know, if, you might not have a great answer because this is one of the, the big questions of self-improvement that I think is really hard. But do you have any tips or any guidance you, you can, uh, you know, explain or tell people for, you know, how do I identify any, you know, a play or a moment that I should at least pay, you know, some focus to? Maybe you're not going to kind of come up with the exact right answer in the moment, but you know, being able to like even just like find that moment, I think is difficult. It's a great question. Um, let me think about how I want to approach answering. Um, you sort of illustrated that sometimes there are moments where you have a, you have a tip off. That's like your, your, your mind tells you either that you're not sure what the right answer is or that this is a really important moment. Um, so like you want to kind of like take a snapshot of those in your mind and revisit them later and to your point of sometimes you don't know what you don't know Mm -hmm. uh you want to like not take things for granted um and and this is something that i struggle with as someone who's been playing for for so long is sometimes you want to feel like well i've learned this concept i've mastered it I want to close the book and, and focus on something else, yep. but that's actually not what you should do. Like you should constantly be willing to reevaluate the way you've always done things and to challenge um, the, the sort of traditional knowledge. So one example that I wrote about recently is um, playing more, you know, more than the minimum number of cards, more than 40 in a draft or more than 60 in a constructed event. And this is something that most, you know, 90 something percent of, of elite players would just say like, no, I'm never going to play more than the minimum number of cards. Playing the minimum is correct. And that's it. Right. But every once in a while you see a corner case situation where an elite player actually does employ this technique of playing more than 40. And when you see that you shouldn't just have the reaction of like, well, they're wrong. They're doing something bad. You should, you should take the approach of like, well, you know, Maybe they're doing something bad, but let me at least try to understand their reasoning and put that through my own filter and see if there's something to learn from the situation. Yeah, it's not like those great players don't have those fundamentals, right? They, of course they have those yeah. fundamentals. They must be doing it for some reason, right? So, yeah, it's it's great to try to dive into that. Um, you know, uh, another maybe uh, heavy hitter topic. I promise to get easier as we go. But, you know, another... Um, trademark i think of you when i watch when i watch you play whether that be you know you're drafting or you're playing a game of modern is just this streamlined logical methodical approach to taking your game actions right and uh i think that's that's something i try to you know do myself try to something i, I try to instill in you know my the people who watch me are trying to get better um just trying to plan out your turn a little bit do you have any mm. you know can you speak to your big picture approach and how you carry out a turn? Maybe you have like a rough checklist, maybe of factors that you take into account when you're making decisions, uh, anything like that. Yeah. So I try to front load my thinking. In other words, think through like your entire sequence of what you want to do in a turn before you start taking actions. Mm -hmm. That's good for two reasons. Number one, or for several reasons even, but um, you, you, you identify like, possible mistakes before you make them instead of as you're making them. Yep. Um, you also give away less information to your opponents instead of like staggering your pauses where like, Oh, you know, I attacked and they blocked. Now I'm going to pause and think for 20 seconds, kind of a tip off that I might have a giant growth in my hand. Right. But if you just think about how you're going to react, if your opponent blocks ahead of time, then you can kind of execute like crisply and efficiently in a way that that doesn't give away that information. And I think uh, part of your question 
involves like what if you face an especially complex situation mm -hmm. where you kind of don't know where to begin and that definitely comes up you 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 can see it sometimes with players like visibly they they face a complicated combat step or board situation and you can see that moment where they just kind of go like you know what i'm not gonna be able to figure this out yeah and they give up and they just make a play and um you know we're all gonna get overwhelmed it's possible magic is such a complicated game that we're all gonna face situations that are beyond our level no matter what our level is yep um but you you just sort of want to break it down into digestible pieces with uh step-by-step -step thinking like what are the most important things? What do I want to accomplish the most? What do I need to avoid the most? Um, and then like, you can just sort of go step by step, working either forward from, from your starting point or backward from your desired endpoint, and just, you know, do the best that you can. And you don't have to get it hundred percent correct, but you have to, you know, um, use your resources and your time to, to, find the best move that you can make in a complicated situation. Yeah, totally. That's a really great way you put it actually. Let's the you know try to start from the end point going backwards of what you want to accomplish or, you know, the the front way of going to, you know, finding an end point. Uh, maybe, you know, without getting too abstract here, do you find yourself doing one or the other more often? Yeah, um I guess I try to use both. Mm -hmm. Um and I find that the thinking backwards, like reverse engineering um is very good when it comes to your overall game plan, like your your big picture strategy for a game. So if you think like what, like yeah, I guess I guess one way to if you're a visual thinker, it's like what picture the turn that I'm actually attacking for lethal or winning the game, and what are the steps that had to happen in order for me to do that. Um, like in limited, it might be well, I have to deal with their Baneslayer Angel bomb rare that beat me last game. So that involves me having to have one of my three removal spells that can kill it ready to go. And, you know, sort of doing the step-by-step -step checklist of all the things that need to happen or need to not happen in order for you to get to to where you want to be yeah yeah i know that makes a lot of sense one of the uh so so one of the big questions that a lot of people ask me they're like you have to ask read these you have to ask read this is you know one of the trademarks of read is absolute level-headedness when playing a game of magic you know it seems like nothing cracks you right is that just a personality trait that carries over uh to magic uh have you have you always been like this or was there was there a way that you know did, did eventually you, you just become so grizzled that you're like okay nothing can crack me um and you know if not, what was the process like? And maybe do you have any tips for people that maybe you're having trouble with their mental game a little bit? Funny, it's sort of like the 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 chicken and the egg thing. Like, did magic appeal to me because I'm such a, a logical, like strategic thinker? Or did I was I trained into these habits by playing a lot of magic? But um certainly I think as a as a professional or competitive magic player, you need to have that ability to stay level and do your best in any situation so you know if if something goes wrong in a game you missed your land drop or your opponent plays a bomb rare or something if you're going to throw up your hands and be like oh my god i can't believe it and, and sort of like lose your cool and quit you're losing a lot of equity sometimes you can win those games you know you just need to like i can't tell you how many games i've won where I had to decide what card to discard to hand size because I missed my land drop. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. And it, it's like a lot. It, there's a temptation to just give up when you face that situation, but you know, you you, you part, that's part of being a good player is capturing that little bit of equity that you still have in, in a situation where things are going badly. Um, so there's a time and a place for experiencing like emotions, frustrations, celebration, joy. When it, when it relates to magic, but I feel like you want to compartmentalize that to do it outside of the game. Yep. So, you know, like you, you play your game and if you want to go vent and tell your friends your bad beat story or, <laughs> you know, scream and shout and punch a punching bag, like you could do those things, whatever you want to do, but don't let it affect your actual, you know, your, your gameplay. Like do that. Don't be constructing your bad beat story that you're going to tell your friends <laughs> while you're still playing the game, like 
play the game, you know, do your best and try, try to work through a bad and, uh, and overcome a bad situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, another thing related to this is the whole, you know, you're definitely a player who like never concedes, right? Back against the wall, mm-hmm. you'll make them attack just, you know, and uh, one of the things that has really stuck with me, just, you know, that mentality, but I think this was from Huey. Huey said this, maybe it was even on like limited resources one time. He said, like, the only reason that you would ever quit a game of magic you know, aside from like not wanting to reveal information, you know, that you're losing, it's because it feels bad, right? Like we're human and it's just like, there's this feeling you're like, I want to get out of this, right? And if if that's the only thing that's making you, you know, not want to stay in the game, like just stay in the game still. <laughs> you know, like you said, you have so much equity that you're giving up if you just, you know, pack in the towels. And sometimes it's not even like an actual quitting the game. It's like a, it's like a mind state thing, kind of like you're, you're kind of alluding to here, where it's like you've mentally checked out. Maybe you're taking game actions, but you're not really trying to win, right? You're just like, okay, well, yeah, I, my opponent had this absurd card here. I can't win. But yeah, I, I think um, really, really would want to, you know, put forth the idea that, yeah, there's so many winnable games that might not look winnable. And especially if you haven't, my experience was if you, if I didn't try to win those games when I was like, okay, this is, this is a tough game. I should just pack it in. You, you kind of build up this uh, expectation where you're just like, okay, well the bad thing happens, then I lose. But if you play those games at a little bit more, you get to the, the point where it's like, the bad thing happened. Oh, but I stuck in it and I won. And then you kind of realize after a while, well, if I stick in it, I'm going to win those bad games a lot of the time. And you kind of reinforce, positively reinforce that a little bit. So kind of, kind of builds on itself. Yeah, it's, it's totally true. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's one of the worst gaming experiences you can have is just sitting there for a long time when you like kind of know that you're going to lose. Yep. Um, but yeah, that, that's part of what magic is. Like you have to be able to play the games where you're ahead. You have to be able to play the games that you're, even and you have to be able to win some number of the games where you're losing so just kind of treat it as a a different category of problem and you know learn how to learn how to work through each each category it's it's important to uh you know that that's why magic's fun is because you get this for i'm not saying magic is fun because (laughs) it's fun when you're mana screwed but it's fun that you have to like experience a, a wide range of games and if you just had your best draw and steamrolled your opponent every time like that would get old fast you know what's <laughs> better you know, you, like, you know what's better than a bad beat story the story where you're like i can't believe i won this game like that was an it's like you not only for you but the person you're you're telling the story to will enjoy that story a lot better than the bad beat story i, I can tell you that yeah here here's a softball one read do you have a favorite limited format maybe a few favorite limited formats good question um so I guess my unusual answer that you, you're probably not expecting to hear is I really loved Shards of Alara. Oh, okay. That like, kind of resonated with me. Um, and it's it, funny because it's it's has some similarities with uh, with Streets of New Capenna where it's like it's designed around the three color shards, but you can also build two color beat down or you can, you know, go four or five colors or whatever. Just a lot of, a lot of flexibility and replayability. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of the ones that, that like sort of everyone likes, my short list would be, um, probably Innistrad, original Innistrad, Cons of Tarkir, and some of the like modern masters formats. Yep. Uh, but I'm super curious, like what, what is, what's your answer to that question? What are some of your favorites? Yeah, those are good ones. Like all, all the new lists are, are, you know, like you said, kind of the, the classic home runs, right? They're they're the ones that everybody goes to and i definitely you know i'm not no exception i like those a lot especially modern masters one was great uh i think mm-hmm. all the modern masters are pretty darn good there's a few in there that like you could you could definitely say it has a few problems but i think for any modern masters format the first five or six or seven drafts are fantastic right it's just that right exact right level of complexity and interesting interactions that you're like oh this is a really cool thing to do that maybe you don't get in every single uh you know standard level expansion um but I think maybe one that is not a you know a normal <laughs> answer. And I've said this before on, on Twitter, I think, but I really liked uh, M19, which is just like some random core set, honestly. But it was it was one of those you know I really enjoy when every single card in the set does something, has some sort of place. Kind of like Innistrad was a little bit like that, and that's why a lot of people liked it. Um, but it's just like oh, this like twelfth pick common. It's it's a weird like you know a three two flash that doesn't do anything else but if i have a bunch mm. of counter spells in my deck like i can kind of build this like weird like blue black like you know never tap out controlish deck so um i i really value uh the packs of a of a of a set having a lot of different viable things in them and i think one of the you know complaints i might have about uh, new capenna and i think a lot of people have is 
Yeah, I remember, you know, a lot of times you, you draft the set and you get to the middle of the pack. You're like, well, there's a bunch of like kind of junky things that I don't really want. And, you know, I think speaking to Modern Masters a little bit, that was another thing that's great. There's so many good playables. You really, it's a little like cube in that way. Where the world's kind of your oyster and you can kind of just like mix and match and, and you know, just do whatever. It's, it's uh, you know, so every draft is a new draft, I think. Yeah, one, one really fun, you know, experience in Limited is like, using a card that's normally bad to yep. good effect or getting it to trade with a card that's much better than it so that that's i, I like that too when you when sort of everything has a job um before we get to the next question can you refresh my memory or our memory what were some of the highlight cards from m19 limited like okay. some of the cool comments? So, so there is heroic reinforcements the the red white uh you know mm -hmm. two, two, get plus one plus one uh what else is there was like uh, there's like the lifelink lifelink or sorry the life gain dex there's like vampire neonate which is the o3 uh tap play two you drain them for one it's like you know weird little one drop doesn't look like it does much um what else was in that set there was like an artifact and enchantment theme in blue white um oh there was it was the set where the the three color dragons were where the bull ass the flip bull ass and right, Palladium right. Wars and all those so that was pretty cool too yeah i like that set cool. <laughs> Um, so, so, you know, a little bit, maybe, maybe divorced from your, uh, favorite, just to play set. Do you have any that you had like specific competitive success with that? You were like, wow, I feel like I know this set inside and out. Like I can, I can draft this in, in every single time. feel like I, I really am, you know, on my game here. Oh, good question. So yeah, a couple, I, I, I made, um, in my, in the course of my career, I made four, uh, pro tour top eights and three of them were, on the back of like going 6-0 in booster draft. Nice. Um, so let me try to think what those formats were. Most recently it was Ravnica Allegiance. Mm. And I think I drafted uh, like slow Azorius decks both times. Yep. Um, but I, I like that format. Like I, I didn't go in thinking I was going to draft Azorius. I'm like, oh, I'm going to build a red-green beatdown deck. <laughs> or, you know, I, liked the, I liked a lot of the, the decks in that format. Yeah. Um, one of the other ones was uh theros block mm, okay and then the other one was uh i think it was shadows over in astrad plus plus eldritch moon i guess those were a couple that i really liked and then i, I grinded a ton of magic online with the the with like lorwyn block and oh. shadow and shadow more block and then shards of alara as well yeah, uh, Lorwyn. That's actually, you know, to revisit your question for one of my favorite sets. Yeah, Lorwyn block. Oh man, I I really really like that set. <laughs> it's it's definitely one of the more like if you're just going back now, like if you were to throw, you know, a uh, a person maybe who's drafted in the past, you know, three four years, no, hadn't done any drafts before that. In it's uh it's one of those sets that's like riddled with onboard tricks where it's just like oh my gosh they tapped their thing and that completely <laughs> traded you know completely affected combat or like they removed my one elf and now my entire board is way smaller or something like that but if uh you know if you're looking for like a challenge uh, of like mental fortitude and, and like onboard tricks if that's like that appeals to you yeah like laura and lord I, I think is really awesome back to you know the the competitive you know the, the pro pro read side of the story here um when you know, you've played against so many amazing players, great players, and I'm sure you felt, you know, both. Oh, I feel like I've, you know, I'm really, you know, on top of my game here, ahead in this game against this great player, or maybe, you know, maybe I'm sure every great player has had the experience of like, wow, my opponent's, you know, running circles around me. Do you feel like there is any particular strength that you have uh, compared to your peers? Or you're like, I uh, this is my, you know, on the kind of video game uh, stats chart here. You're like, my my stat here is really really high. Or maybe uh, one that you feel like, ah, oh, like my my peers, my pro peers, like they've got that nailed down. And maybe that's that's something that uh, you know I would I would like to up in my game a little bit. That's a cool question. Um, I would say what I like most about Magic and maybe maybe my strength is resource management mm. like I, you know I'm, I'm known for playing like kind of grindy decks where you're like attacking your opponent's resources uh, a lot you know maybe making people discard or whatever it might be trading off um and i like playing those games where it's like you play 15 turns and you've gotten like you know a two for one here and like sort of a marginal advantage here we got the loot or scry or get you know like get a little bit of value left behind basically just like a handful of exchanges where you're slightly ahead after each one right and that accumulates to you know you being ahead in the long run or, or having having a slight advantage in the long run um so i, I think I'm, I'm good at like approaching the game in that way 
I'm weaker at, um, you know, there's some players who are just so good at like sort of navigating those close race situations. You think of like the Delver players, the mm-hmm. Fairies players who, you know, flash creatures and tempo counter spells and bounce and stuff that that was never the type of magic that I felt like I was, you know, world class at. Um, but I could beat those players by just making them discard their counter spells and <laughs> killing, their, killing their delvers, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, Thoughtseize thought is your best friend in that situation, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so, so I mean, uh, you know, you play a lot of... Actually, here's here's a question that off the top of my head that I don't actually know. Did you start uh, playing Constructed or start with Limited? <laughs> when I started playing, it, there was not much distinction. Oh, okay, I mean, sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the way I started playing Magic was uh, my we, <laughs> my brother got what, what at the time was called a starter pack. A right, starter right. Pack, technically three boosters just like stapled together with with lands in it yeah so we each got a starter pack and it, it's like that's that's what you had that was your deck and then it, you know I, i'd spend my allowance buying a, a booster pack once per week and like kind of incorporate the best cards that i opened in, in, into my deck or whatever um so in that sense like i guess you could say it was constructed but um <laughs> lightly it, it was a much different <laughs> like experience of constructed magic yeah totally so i guess let's okay so if you you know uh you go to your local game store for the first time or maybe even like you know magic online what was what were you drawn to there um at the local store i think i started with with constructed it was like we'd have the every sunday like a constructed tournament mm-hmm. and i didn't really get into booster draft and well okay i got into i, I remember they, they started having sealed deck tournaments around like invasion like odyssey onslaught and then it was probably onslaught uh where where i got really into booster drafting when i got magic online uh i actually distinctly remember that i only played booster draft and when they started having magic online ptqs it was like oh geez now i gotta i gotta scrape together like to build a constructed deck, uh, which, you know, it, it's expensive on Magic yeah. Online, especially if you're starting from scratch and don't have a collection. Um, so, yeah, I played, played a lot of a lot of limited at that stage in my career. As a player, you know, who has played both, I feel like these days, and maybe, you know, I have a skewed view of this potentially, but I feel like there's, like, the constructed players and then there's the limited players, right? And, you know, there's definitely some people who play a good mix of both. But as somebody who's, you know, played you know, quite a bit of both in your time. Do you feel like there's skills that limited players can learn from constructed or vice versa that constructed players could, you know, stand to learn from, from the limited players or just, you know, skills you pick up in those formats that can be, uh, you know, applied, uh, you know, cross formats. Totally. Yeah. Um, I think playing limited magic is really good for building like your fundamental understanding of the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, a huge thing is that like limited is, very centered around the combat step and constructed is often not but sometimes is right so if you are like a constructed only player and you suddenly find yourself in one of these scrappy games where like you've got to double block your opponent's creatures and like you know set up these these uh race situations and know when to trade creatures and when to not trade creatures those are skills that like you you were, would have been well served developing in limited. Um, uh, so I, I like to like sometimes I'll I'll coach or meet a player who has a background in one format or the other, and I definitely think there are skills that you can like build on and leverage when you're making the transition one one way or the other. So combat steps is big in limited. Resource management is big in limited, and then if you want to work the other way, the constructed players tend to be really good at um, like pattern recognition. Like, uh, you know, I've identified that I can profitably line up this card against this card. So I'll try to make that happen when I can. And and you can apply that to limited as well. Like, oh, you know, my opponent's got one toughness creatures. So I'll, I'll, I'll find like the, the patterns and cards that are really good at punishing one toughness creatures. Um, you know, we're sort of abstract and difficult to give a concrete example, but, but I, I do think that it exists and you build different skill sets playing different types of magic. Yeah, I think, no, you so, so totally, you know, like I said, it's a little bit abstract, but even just once you start playing, 
you know, especially in limited formats that maybe there are a few less viable decks, you know, for in Streets of New Capenna, there is, uh, you know, the whole conversation that, like, you know, Broker's Bant, the Bant Shard is very, uh, you know, very prominent, very powerful. And I think in Constructed, you know, you get kind of matchup experience where you're like, yeah, yeah, I kind of know how this goes out. And and I think you can very much apply that to, like, how the commons line up in Limited, too. So, yeah, even, you know, um, it is a little bit abstract for sure, but just knowing, you know, when, I, when I'm when i super, super in tune with Limited format, I know, okay, around turn three, turn four, these are the types of threats my opponents are going to play. You know, if they're leaving up four mana here, these are the types of cards they're going to have in this given deck, right? It's not, and especially in limited, it's a smaller card set, right? You can definitely like deduce much easier how they're going to be able to, how they're, you know, what cards they might be able to play. And I think, um, you know, just knowing in constructed, well, actually, you know, I guess maybe not, that's not even true that it's a smaller card set in limited because in constructed, you know, most of the time what your opponent's deck is. So you're like, okay, they could have these two instants and just training yourself to kind of um, preemptively just guess, right? Always thinking what your opponent could be doing, always thinking what your opponent might have. I think, you know, those are skills that, at least for myself, that I've been able to transfer, you know, uh, both ways pretty much. Yeah, that you, you know, you gave a really good example. You sort of like uh, jogged my memory of, of, I think, one concrete example of where I applied constructed lessons to limited is uh, going back to Konzatar here, which I mentioned, one of my favorite draft formats and uh, like sort of the floor for a playable draw there would be going like land, nothing, land, nothing, land, morph. Yeah. You know, two, two creature face down. So, you know, I had a breakthrough moment in limited where in that limited format where I, I was like, okay, let me think about, in concrete terms, like when is it okay or not okay for me to keep that hand? Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of pattern recognition that I think you get into constructed from constructed where it's like, okay, I I'm learning my white weenie deck. I've learned that I should not keep a hand without a creature that I can play on turn one or two, or better yet, I'm playing against a white weenie deck and I'm starting to identify the hands that are fast enough or not fast enough to like, you know, keep play pay pace and get to play the game. So then you can start applying those like Mulligan decisions, pattern recognition, uh, op openings, you know, desirable openings to to your limited game as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think I think a very much a you know keeper them all right. That's just like knowing mm -hmm. what kind of hands are acceptable in limited. Like maybe the format's faster where you're like, no, you got you need a two drop, right? You you can't have a you know a four drop or you know like you said the morph is an acceptable three drop in that cons in cons right it's like totally fine to not do anything till three but in other formats you got you got to know like well that's you know it's not just across the board in every limited format you can keep these kind of hands in this kind you know maybe in ravnica allegiance for example it was okay to go you know tap land into tap land into dovin's acuity on three or whatever maybe you have a slime bind in there in the mix but yeah yeah totally i think i think that's a big price where it comes up on so you know you're very much a prolific uh content creator at this point i would say maybe you know potentially one of the you know people who has po contributed the most to magic's content sphere in the past you know decade or so I, I i would say you put up this awesome awesome set of articles uh back in 2015 or around then um it was like uh it was a level up series uh where it was just going over the basics going over the level two level level one level two of magic fundamentals um Magic's changed a little bit uh, since then, since 2015, I think. Especially in limited commons, it's become a little more powerful. Rares have become more powerful and constructed. Um, do you have any, like, maybe slight updates that if you were to go back and, you know, update th those articles uh, for today's Magic, anything that would, you know, maybe not as specific, but maybe the, the, uh, the actual question I'm trying to get here is, how do you think Magic has changed in the past five, six, seven years? Uh, well, first of all, Alex, th thanks a lot for that uh, introduction. I haven't really heard anyone, you know, say that, but uh, I'm glad <laughs> that I, I do work hard on my, my magic content. Thank you for saying it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're you're referencing the level one column that I wrote for the the main like Wizards website That's uh, the one, yeah. all those years ago. And yeah, magic has changed. That that was supposed to be a pretty like baseline uh, set of articles that you know, could be applied to a wide range of, of uh, formats. And actually just before um, we went live here, I was listening to your last episode where you're talking about sealed deck. Mm -hmm. And one thing that, that resonated with me, you're like, you're like, play the good cards. Yeah. <laughs> right? and, and I was like, yes, that's exactly it. And that's been, that's been, you know, that's been the key like ever since uh, the old days. So when I talk about like very fundamental limited uh, concepts, 
I try to say like if if you want to focus on cards that either are creatures or kill creatures, mm -hmm. you want to you want to and, and it, you if something doesn't do one of those two things, you should have a very high standard before you put it in your deck, and you know stick to those basics of like clean mana base, mana curve, creature base. Um, so I think a lot of that stuff still holds true, although there are many opportunities where you can make magic more complex and do these cool things in these like corner case limited situations. Um, I guess before I go further, like to what extent do you agree with that? Do you, you know, are those sort of the, the limited fundamentals that you still go by or, oh, or yeah. teach? Yeah, yeah, no, totally. I think 100%. Like we're very much in agreement with, you know, what, uh, what our baselines are 100%. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that that's still a good baseline for people who are just getting into limited. Um, but it, yeah, it's it's good to note that magic has gotten generally more powerful, generally faster, mm -hmm. and generally more complex. Like I was kind of uh, like discussing or lamenting the other day how how like some of these cards are so complex that. I, like even as a 20 year veteran or more, you know, more than that at this point, like sometimes I can't fully understand what a card does. Like the first time I read it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's like, very different from like when you, you know, if you were played like M10 draft, like the cards were pretty simple and, and straightforward. And it was, it was the rules of the game that created the complexity, but now like the cards just individually are, are, are very complex and sometimes difficult to work with. Um, so yeah, just, I guess, learning that there's going to be like case by case stuff and, and that you, you, it takes a little bit longer to grasp exactly what's going on in a, in a format that you're new to. Well, and I also think that's very comforting and reassuring to a lot of people out there. I'm sure hearing you say that somebody who hasn't played 20 plus years, because I see a lot of people, people, you know, players being hard on themselves for being like, oh, I can't believe I missed that. Like it, it says that right on the card, of course, you know, and we're only human. We can only process so much, right? I think to your point there, focus you know, on those fundamentals. The complexity is like, so there is room for getting edges, understanding the complexities, making sure you know every single line of text on the cards. But even the best players are going to mess up something once in a while. You know, it, and it doesn't hurt to reread it. You know, you, you always see the best players, you know, look over totally. the table and be like, what's this do? Even though you think you might know what it does, right? You're just like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. it just does that, right? So I, I think, you know, my advice is always just like, if you focus on those fundamentals, like, yeah, you, you can have, you can build that core, that foundation. And then, you know, once in a while, yeah, sure. You're going to mess up. But if you've got that baseline where you don't have a lot, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of mental bandwidth on you, you can uh, kind of, you know, uh, commit those fundamentals to memory. You can then spend some of the mental energy on those complexities that, and uh, yeah, as you said, magic has got a lot more of that <laughs> in recent years. That's such a good point. Like that, that's such a good point. I, I tend to call that like being in shape, quote mm -hmm. unquote, is like when you have a good, like when you, you, you have good fundamentals and like know what's going on, it frees up your mental energy, your bandwidth to like process a new card that you're seeing and incorporate that into, into your, your strategy, like pretty quickly or just, you know, it frees you up to see these cool plays uh, when, you know, instead of like when you're kind of unfamiliar with the game and you're like struggling so hard to, you know, make sure you have the proper mana to cast your spell, then it, it's hard to to see everything on the periphery. But if you if you have the good fundamentals, then it increases your your ability to process new stuff and your you learn faster, everything like that. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. So just to close this out here, one of the uh, main prompts that you know what it led me to reaching out to you and see if you wanted to come up the show off the show was uh you you just released a, i think one of the just best magic articles that i'm going to be pointing people to for years to come uh, and i think it's called valuable tips for for magic players that want to get better that's on channel fireball by the way i actually linked it in last week's episode um and awesome thank you yeah i thought it was just fantastic it was just such a good compendium of great thoughts about the game and um I just wanted to get some of your thoughts, uh, just a little bit, you know, maybe expand, but it doesn't even have to be expand. Just, just if I can uh, proliferate some of the information that you put out there, I, I would love to do that for our listeners. So I have three points in there that I, I'd love some thoughts on for you. And the one that I 
as soon as I saw this, I screenshotted it and I put it in like the big picture discussion uh, uh, part of my Discord. I'm just like, this is fantastic. Please, everybody read this. And what you said was, you don't need anything special in order to win. And this was, uh, you know, that's a broad thing in general. But the way you ex ex uh, described it was just, your deck doesn't need a thing that it's like, I'm winning with this. You know, this is the obviously the, I think most good or intermediate players know at this point. You don't need like a win condition necessarily, but you could, you even took it a step further where you're like, your deck doesn't need, you know, a great rare or, you know, a, a necessarily like, the thing you can point to. You're just like, oh, but this is the advantage my deck has over other things. If you're just playing a game of magic uh, and, you know, playing it well and navigating it with, you know, some, some amount of, um, you know, diligence and, and just doing it properly, you can win a game of magic there. And I don't know, I've just, you know, I, I've explained a lot of it here, but I would like to hear a bit more of your thoughts on that. Maybe uh, for those people who haven't read it potentially. Yeah. So I have a distinct memory of um, there were a handful of tournaments where Ben Stark was uh, hired to do like a, you know, Friday night before the tournament, do a seminar about, about limited or sealed deck, like yeah. before the limited Grand Prix. So I would go and just sit in the audience and, uh, at one point, he receives a question that's something along the lines of, uh, what if my deck isn't good enough? Like, what if my deck's not powerful enough and I feel like I have to splash my, my rare with bad mana or whatever? Yep. And Ben's answer was like, that there's no such thing. There, there's not a threshold where your deck is powerful enough or not powerful enough. You can usually just focus on the fundamentals and play like your baseline set of creatures on a curve and, and have decent mana. And that's, you know, that's what you need to succeed in magic. There's not some magic formula where, where if your opponent's deck is like a certain percentage more powerful than you, you automatically lose. Like you're still shuffling up and playing the games. Therefore you should just build your deck in the way that your, your own deck is going to function, uh, you know, the, the, the best. Yep. And sometimes, you know what, the deck with the with the extra bomb rare, like they might miss their land drop or they might be missing a color and you might just beat them with your commons like that happens all the time in limited. So uh, I guess it's it's sort of like a don't panic kind of thing. And um, circling back to one of the points we talked about at the beginning of the show, like you you should learn as a magic player to to pick up equity when things are not going well when you don't have the dream limited deck when you don't have the perfect opening like that's those are still games that you can win and just learn how to maximize your equity and don't panic yeah yeah big time like you know you can i a, a lot of times people look at the deck um as it's almost like an auto battler a little bit where it's like well the deck's gonna play itself out and you know like whatever happens happens but there's so much you can gain from tight play and you know making the right decisions to play making that one more right decision over your opponent right that's it's it's there's a lot to gain in just the piloting itself and like you said the, the luck of it sometimes you know your opponent does miss that land drop or you draw that fifth land right on time when you really needed to there's so many factors that are just outside of this is what my deck is in a vacuum right and you know the, mm -hmm. the actionable part like you said and i want to reiterate this is you don't have to have bad mana you don't have to hope to get lucky by like shoving you know all the best cards in your deck without any good you know chance of casting it. You don't you don't have to go for broke, right? You you just want to play your best game of magic possible and, and set yourself up to do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Something that I like to say, and a lot of this stuff, a lot of times it's saying it to myself, like to bring myself back to to, to earth and uh, and sort of encourage myself is when you play these long limited tournaments, like say a Grand Prix or, you know, one of the Magic Online events or something or the Arena Open, getting a good or a bad sealed deck is only one small part of having like a good day of Magic. Right. right? So you can have the best deck ever. I mean, I've had the experience of having the best deck ever and then you just get mana screwed a couple matches or, you know, your, your opponent plays a bomb that you can't answer, whatever, you know, whatever. Like there's a million ways to lose in limited just because you got a great deck doesn't mean you're entitled to automatically win. And conversely, like just because you have an unexciting deck a four out of 10 or a five out of 10 doesn't mean you can't just have a good run and play well and, and draw well and beat some stronger decks. Like the games are not decided as soon as you, you submit your deck. Totally. As soon as you open your packs. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. Uh, we're gonna move into a 
quick Q and A here, but before we do read, I just want to give you know a big, big thank you to you for coming on. Do you have any uh, last words? Maybe a big nugget of wisdom <laughs> to put you on the spot here that you would say to you know just those folks that are looking to get better at you know magic limited really anything you know the floor is yours to say whatever you'd like <laughs> sure well why don't we just recap the important points that we've we've uh, touched on because i think he did a great job sort of like bringing us to, to really important talking points um but it's focus on long-term improvement understanding what's going on in the games rather than just jamming a million games and then saying what now, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, and then uh, stay like level-headed, don't give up when things are bad and um, focus on fundamentals. Like, the, you know, just have that, that good foundation. So if you do those three things, you will be able to approach any format, limited or constructed, uh, you know, Streets of New Capenna or uh, something that's coming out in the year 2025. Like those things will still all apply to, to playing good magic at, at any point that you use them. Yeah, hundred percent. And, you know, before we wrap up, I of course want to give you an opportunity to shout out, you know, any of your, um, you know, platforms, anywhere people can find you. Maybe they want to tune into your content, read your content, uh, contact you, ask you a question or anything like that. Yeah, you've already done it. I, I mean, all my stuff goes up on, on channel fireball right now. Uh, a good portion of it is free, including the the videos, and I, I have my own stream here on Twitch. And then we also have our CFB Pro offerings, which is sort of like if you want to uh, tap into the next level of uh, those strategic deep dives, like the one you, you you referenced, or deck guides to pair with the the video content. Um, so yeah, that's, that's CFB Pro. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I, if it wasn't clear already, and I'm sure I made it very clear, uh, I would recommend those articles and videos from Reed. I think he does a phenomenal job. All right, well, uh, Twitch chat, if you have any questions for Reed, you know, we'll give uh, a few minutes for people to think and ask questions. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll open the floor uh, for people to you know, ask Reed within reason, <laughs> whatever they want. All right, uh, Small Sam says, a question for Reed. How has Magic moving to preliminary online play changed your view for the future in the community? Um, so in general, I think there are a lot of great things about online Magic, including giving people access that might not always have um, like the resources to travel or they might not have a local store community or whatever. Uh, and of course, like my, one of the best things ever, like my favorite things about magic as a, as a game is uh, this guy, Dmitry Budakov, who is the, you know, arguably the most successful magic online player of all time. He was magic online champion uh, in two, two separate occasions. He is from, Siberia. Mm. Like it is impossible for him to get to a tournament, you know, because he's got to travel like so far to even get to an airport. It, it, it's, it's inaccessible, but that didn't stop him because in part because of, of uh, the online magic offerings from, it didn't stop him from competing against the best players in the world and like making his footprint on the game and just, you know, engaging with magic in the way that he wanted to. So that's, that's awesome. I love that online magic uh, makes it accessible for people. Um, that said, there are a lot of people who love, who fell in love with magic because of the paper card game, myself included. So I think, uh, it's, it's good, important. And, uh, it seems to be the way the wind is blowing that, that, uh, there's going to be continue, continue being support for, um, for magic in paper at all levels of competition. And I think that's, that's great for sort of the foundation, the infrastructure of the game. Uh, the point being that they're, they're everyone should engage with magic in the way that works for them and is fun for them. And for some people that's going to be online, some people that's going to be paper. And for some people it's going to be both. Yeah. I think, I think there are, uh, you know, there's push and pull with, with that. Like, you know, there's, there's some things that maybe people are going to be slightly disappointed that, Oh, there's not as many paper events I can travel to. You know, I really enjoy grinding the GPs potentially those, um, you know, people might lose out on a little bit, but there is, like you mentioned, there are so many, I think so many benefits for, um, you know, being able to play, you know, even myself, like I'm, you know, able-bodied, you know, pretty young guy that, you know, can, has the ability to travel if I'd like to, but just having, being able to go like, oh, there's an arena tournament this weekend. That's a lot more convenient. You know, I think that's, that's just also very helpful as well. Yep. Totally. Uh, okay, so another question here from P Dog. Reed, what is your take on forcing decks in limited versus staying open and finding your lane more organically? Ah, uh, good question. This is um, so I, I referenced Ben Stark as 
somebody who like I've learned a lot from and, and really respect as a magic teacher, um, especially for limited. This is something that I actually don't fully agree with him on. And, and he he's big on, I think his famous article was called drafting the hard way mm -hmm. where he said like, if, you know, you should, you should basically always be open to drafting any color combination or archetype uh, in a perfect world. I don't necessarily agree. Um, and there's two ways that you can break from this mold. Number one is if you've just identified that certain strategies are way worse or way better than others. Uh, I think it's okay to like move the needle so that you're, you're avoiding or moving towards them uh, more often. Uh, so I guess a concrete example would be like, if you were the first person ever to find the spider spawning deck in original Innistrad or the first person ever to find the cycling deck in Ikoria with Zenith Flare, like just draft that, you yeah. know, <laughs> like, you're going to win so much more uh, because you have this like unique kind of busted strategy that other people don't, don't uh, know about. So that's, that's a good reason. Um, and then another reason is uh, if you like have not had time to master all of the archetypes and uh, you know, funny, I'll, I'll like kind of uh, reveal myself a little bit here, but I, I, I uh, am invited to play like a streamer championship in streets of new Capenna nice. uh, next week or two weeks from now or something like that. Yeah. I think it's next week. And uh, I'm pretty far behind in the format. Like I talked to you before the stream, I've probably done, you know, 10 ish seals and drafts, which is enough to know the cards, but not enough to like be on the level of, of someone like you or someone who's, who's actually like super, super engaged with the format. So I'm, I'm sitting here going like, what am I going to do to give myself the best chance of beating players who are like way more experienced than me in this format. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of thinking like, maybe I'll just choose a couple of archetypes to be really good at and have in my back pocket. And instead of trying to process and learn an entire format on the fly, I'll just be like, Hey, you know, I'll draft white green beat down or yep. something like that. Um, and just, just try to do a good job, like sort of narrow the focus and try to do a good job with that. Um, so circling back to the original question in a perfect world, you will be experienced and open to as many different archetypes as possible because, uh, that makes you flexible. And it means that if, if what you want to draft is not there, you have backup plans, but I do think it's okay to have preferences and go a little bit more, uh, towards the direction that you, you, you want to take the draft. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely, I think I'm, I'm very in line with, with your thoughts there. And a re related question for Endo Jackson, how does Reed feel knowing that Jund is the worst combo in Streets of New Capenna? <laughs> Oh no! Is that in <laughs> is that in limited? Yeah, uh, yeah, in limited. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, we got the, we got the best the best charm. Yeah, you did get the uh, best charm. Um, yeah, at least that I think the colors individually have some good stuff. Like Blitz is a cool mechanic, and the red black sacrifice deck yep. uh, can do some some cool stuff. But yeah, you know, I guess draft draft Riveteers if you get like Zeatora or one of the sweet like yeah you know, exactly. Multiple color gold cards but otherwise uh you can just piecemeal and take take what you like and leave what you know yeah <laughs> uh well it just means that that you know if everybody knows that then reed will get the, the awesome uh the awesome riveteers deck because nobody wants yeah, there you go. uh from sirkovitz do you lean on data analysis in testing and independently of the answer what's your opinion on data use in magic oh this is a great question because um 17 lands.com has come into its own like in the period where I was not really competing in limited, mm -hmm. uh, like limited of course was a pro tour format, but once we moved to the online play from home structure, I hardly ever played like competitive limited events. So this is a new resource that when the pro tour comes back and when I do have to compete in limited again, I'm going to have to learn the best way to incorporate this into my game. And I do definitely think like, this is a very, very real resource that you should not be ignoring um but the the how exactly you should use it is not 100 percent clear this is part of why you know i i like to learn from uh cr creators like yourself alex you know <laughs> uh, lords of limited and limited resources and sam black's podcast and stuff i like to learn like how you know i look at the 17 lands data what's the best way for me to translate that into actually winning my own games um circling back to the question 
we used to, uh, we would have like our pro tour testing team and we would record our own drafts. So we would have by the end, a spreadsheet of like a couple hundred drafts that we'd done nowhere near the sample size of, of 17 lands, but we would have enough to speak intelligently and be like, Oh, that's weird. You know, like Riveteers is winning at a much lower rate than the other color combinations. Like, what do we make of this? Yeah. So, yeah, I do think I think having the data is is definitely a resource and it's important to just incorporate that in, in whatever way is best for you. Uh, from Dragon Reborn, uh, how do you think WotC can better present limited magic to an audience to improve the viewer experience and consequently drive greater interest in high level limited magic in general? Good question. Speaking as a viewer, I like to watch limited when I'm able to watch the whole thing, like starting from the draft. Mm -hmm. So they've, uh, they have really improved the, the coverage of actual drafts. Like it's awesome when you'll have, um, you know, like pair of great commentators, let's say like, you know, Marshall and Luis or something, or, uh, Marshall and Cedric, whoever it might be, um, cut, they'll like cover a player's draft. Then they'll show the draft table and they'll be like, okay, now we're going to check what happened to like this person who's two seats away and they'll show another draft. And then by, by the time they've shown a couple, you have an idea of like what's going on at the table. You're sort of invested in the players and then you get to watch how the matches play out. Yeah, That's a um, really fun experience for me, but that's not the way everyone engages with coverage. And if you're just sort of flipping channels and you come into a draft match where you're like, oh, I don't know what's in their decks. I didn't watch the draft. It's kind of like hard to follow. You might just flip the channel again and not be interested in that. So that's that's the hurdle that we have to overcome. Um, but I do think it's really fun when you get to watch a player draft start to finish. And then when you get invested in like what's actually going on at this whole draft table, uh, that that's a cool experience, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that they, like you said, recently, I think it was for, <laughs> uh, man, I don't even remember the event it was, but they covered... Paulo for a draft. Uh, I think it was they were drafting Midnight Hunt. Uh, so whatever there was the biggest event around there. And that could they, have been the World Championships. Yes, yep. I think it was. I think it was the World Champion thing, and I think they did a really, really fantastic job. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, Limited has been, you know, not not quite in the spotlight of you know the high tier competitive Magic uh, tournaments as of late, but you know, maybe hopefully in the next little while um, we can we can slide <laughs> a few more Limited things back in there. That that would be awesome. Um, from Fjork, what is your favorite non-Jund deck you've played in Modern? Uh, okay, so... <laughs> well, in Modern, uh, in addition to Jund, I also like Golgari and Rakdos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My, the two decks I've been playing most lately have been Jund and, and uh, Yawgmoth. Nice. Um, so I like those kind of creature-based combo decks. I find those fun. Uh, I do like the card Urza Saga, so getting to play some cool, like, you know, Hardened Scales stuff where... You have interesting combat steps. Is it enjoyable for me? In the past, I've played Elves. I've played Storm. Um, I've played Infect. Yeah, I guess... Creature I guess combo. <laughs> it sounds like very... Yeah, creature-based combo decks. Yeah. Those, those are cool. Yeah. And I do have uh, one question. I remembered somebody uh, before the show asked me that uh, I think they'd be, they'd be upset if I didn't I didn't ask you. Where does... Where's the origin of Reader Rabbit come from? Were you were you a fan of uh, the the old uh, Reader Rabbit computer games when you were a kid? Yeah, so it is it is like the origin is you know way back in in primordial times is based on that that game Reader Rabbit. Yeah, which is like a learning game for kids to like you know help 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 you learn to read and stuff. But mostly it was just that like my. I had like friends and family who just called me Reader Rabbit when I was really little. Oh, like, yeah, that, that, that's cute. You know, it's it's stuck, and that'll be my that'll be my name. Little did I know I'd be like 32 years old, and people like know me as Reader Rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like I I mean the first time I ever read that like I you know I was, this is like you know a decade ago or maybe whatever at this point the first time I read that when you were playing Magic Online it gave me a good chuckle. I was like oh you know I I get that one I get that reference. So I'm sure there's a lot of people who have had that experience too. All right, last question as we close out here. Reed, what's your favorite match of Magic you played from Angus? Favorite match of Magic that I've ever played? Boy, there's a, a handful. Um, but yeah, the, the, the matches of Magic that are most memorable for me is like really when you really get in the weeds with those tough like creature combats. So I had one uh, against Brian Kibler is round five of Worlds 2013, or sorry, round six of Worlds 2013. 
and I was playing Jund with like Huntmaster and Thrag Tusk, and he was playing um, like a red green beatdown deck with like mm-hmm. Domri Raid and Thundermar Hellkite. And it was great because like that th- th- that was just both of us like right in our wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, like Kibler is the dragon master. He's just so good at navigating creature combat. And, uh, you know, I, I like to play Jund. I like to play it against creature decks. And he actually beat me in three games there, but it was like just such a sick match. Um, I had two great matches against Brad Nelson at Grand Prix Miami. Um, I was playing the same deck, actually, Jund and Standard. And uh, I had a great one against uh, Taejun Hao in Pro Tour Rivals of Ixalan, where I was playing Abzan in Modern against Humans. Uh, but in all cases, like they were just memorable for me because of those those really like tough combat games where you got to use like creatures to attack and block, small amount of well placed removal spells, and just find a way to to get through. Yeah, and and you know maybe this is uh, you know an example of why you like these decks so, uh, so much because they you know you don't get those games when you're playing ad nauseum or whatever it is you know it's yeah. just like yeah. All right, well Reed, thank you so much for coming on the show. This is a blast. I had so much fun and. Uh, I, I just you know want to uh, really once again highlight you know how how great of a content creator I think you are. I'm gonna put some notes uh, in the show notes uh, for people if they want to find them. And uh, yeah, that's Bruna Call the show. Reed, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, maybe maybe uh, I would I would be glad if you could come again on again at some point. Yeah, thank you so much, Alex, for you know all the all the kind words and just for having me on and great great conversation about magic. Sweet. Thanks everyone for listening. All right, everybody, I'm going to sign off here. And uh, everybody, have a good night. And yeah, we'll see you next time on the next episode of Limited Level Ups. See you, everybody.